name is Mary Beth Storjahan. I am the founder of Workable Wealth, and I once wrote a book, and so apparently that qualifies me to talk to you all, according to Alan Moore, who's not here, so send him emails if I'm terrible. Uh, my book is Work Your Wealth. Uh, it came out in March of this year, and you can tell by the cover that it's probably not geared towards the men in this group. Um, so questions. Raise your hand if you are a financial planner in here. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Raise your hand if you have already written a book. Okay, right. That, no, totally, yeah, you're in process, okay. And then um, raise your hand if you want to know, so we have two things to talk about today. It's gonna be very conversational. If you wanna know the process of writing the book, or, okay, process, raise your hand. Perfect, and then marketing the book once it's launched. Okay, cool, okay, so I just wanna make sure that we are, I'm like, oh, where are we, okay. So I'll do a, a quick intro, like overview of how I wrote the book, the process that I took. Um, we'll walk through all of that and then uh, we'll go into like the marketing. So what this is up here, this is a lot of, what happened was Alan Moore interviewed me on the XYPN podcast probably about six months ago about the process of writing my book. What I then did, I just told Hillary, I had my intern write down all the questions he asked me, so we're basically gonna go through that same interview. Let's make it conversational, ask questions throughout, let me know if I talk too fast. Okay, how long do you need to work on the project, concept, all of that stuff, concept to launch? Um, I happened to write the book, start writing the book, three months after I had my baby. So honestly, it probably took me about six months from concept to launch, that was my timeline. It can be shorter or longer depending on how much you enjoy writing. I enjoy writing and I actually had a lot of content um, from my blog already, so we'll talk about leveraging that. Ebook, Kindle, traditional publisher, which version makes the most sense? So how many of you are self-publishing or considering self-publishing? Okay, so I have been approached by publishers. I personally chose to self-publish. The reason I chose to self-publish is because just like with the Workable Wealth brand, I wanted complete control over the process. I felt that, I had, I had a vision. I had this cover in my mind before I even had the book launched. So, I didn't want to give that up. And I felt that if I chose to publish through a traditional publisher, I wouldn't necessarily have as much say. Um, while you can self-publish and always choose to go traditional afterwards, I couldn't probably sign with the publisher and then change my mind. So that was my personal decision. It really depends on how much of a hand you want in the process. There are pros and cons to each, but with the way, I think there's a panel later on that is going to debate you know, traditional versus self-publishing. Um, at this point in time with the way marketing is in the world, I mean, you're, either way you're gonna have to help to market your book and you're gonna be held accountable to that. So it just depends on where your target audience is. If you think your target audience is in Barnes and Noble, then hey, maybe go the traditional route. Most of my target audience is online, so I had no problem leveraging Facebook groups and social media to help market it. How many of you suffer from imposter syndrome? Be honest, no, but you, you all never doubt yourselves? All right, fine. I doubted myself. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, pers we're here at a personal finance writing conference. There's clearly a lot of content out there already that addresses all of this stuff. So when it comes to writing a book, how do you even get the confidence to say, hey, I have something different to say, what's the spin on it that you can take? So when you're writing a personal finance book, I think the most important thing is you have to know who your, your client avatar is. You can't just go out there and say, hey, I'm writing a personal finance book. Even you can't even say I'm writing a personal finance book for women. It just doesn't necessarily even work that way anymore. You need to go in, just like you go into your own business, with your client avatar in mind. So when I wrote Work Your Wealth, I had already started, my business, while well, I work with a lot of Gen Y, millennials, I work with Gen Xers as well, my business had started shifting towards working with creative entrepreneurs. So for me, I already knew some of the questions they were coming to me with. I was getting tagged in Facebook groups. I was getting emails. Um, so for me, I figured, okay, what is out there right now and how can I use my voice to put a different spit on that? How can I break down the barriers for women especially? How can I make it easier for them to understand? How can I make this topic um, fun for them and something that they actually want to pay attention to? For women especially, it started with like, let's just deal with like the there's so much guilt and stress and anxiety around finances with women. They feel terrible about themselves, whether or not they admit it or not. They beat themselves up a lot. 
So my goal with the book and with everything else I do around the branding of the book is like, hey, let's, let's just like take stock of where you are and let's move on. Like there's no reason to keep ignoring the problem or keep beating ourselves up. So when it comes to your book and what you're thinking about doing, you have, I would just encourage you to figure out, okay, just like you did with your business, who am I writing this for and how can I put a unique spin on it? That was one of the things that pushed me to write the book. I saw that there was stuff out there, but there's stuff out there that just targets them in general. So even you can see down to the packaging and the bright colors and the glittery dollar sign, I wanted to make this eye-catching for that group of women. So how does a book factor into my practice? So marketing, the ability to help with prospective clients, and there's a lot of credibility for speaking engagements and consulting gigs. So I have been, Workable Wealth has been in practice now, I've been in practice for three years. Um, I have client income, I have speaking income, I have writing income. The book came about because when, with targeting millennials and Gen Y, there's often, yes, there are clients who can pay me, and there's quite a few of them as well, but there are, are also quite a few clients who can't pay me, or prospective clients who can't pay me, who aren't actually in the position to work with a financial planner. Um, but I do want to provide some sort of help and education to them, and for me, doing my free 30 minute consultation calls was not the way I wanted to spend my time. So by getting a lot of those schedules, getting a lot of those requests, um, and then my, my scheduler on my, um, my consultation request form asks for like income information, asks for what's the most pressing question. So I was already getting questions from these people who I knew weren't qualified or, or I could see they weren't qualified. So that was basically what also gave me information gathering for writing the book. Um, but yeah, so basically now when somebody emails me or requests a consultation and they're not qualified, I have a whole pre-drafted email that says, hey, thanks so much for reaching out. Um, at the, you know, my passion is educating and empowering 20s, 30s, 40s somethings around their finances. My fees start here. Um, I don't think it'll be a fit for us to work together at this time based on your financial situation, but check out my book, which is $13, links to it on Amazon. Check out these blog posts, um, and then check out, like I think I report back to the XY Planning Network as well. But that way, oh, and then I have a Facebook group that I've created around the book that we'll talk about. And then I, I invite them to join the Facebook group where I host that group. I have daily prompts and I engage my, um, the people in the group in conversation so they can head there to learn and get some sort of advice as well. So that's helped in marketing and just building brand awareness, right? So even though I might not be, they might not be qualified, that's not to say that they don't have friends who could be qualified and they are talking to their friends and other people are buying the book. And so by still being able to provide value to them in some small way, I'm staying in front of them, I'm keeping them in front of me. If I can get them into the Facebook group, I'm keeping that relationship going longer. And so that's been really helpful for marketing and brand awareness in the, pack, in the practice. Um, and then speaking engagements and consulting gigs. So, and this is just depends if you have the time for that or enjoy doing that. Uh, I no longer, it's just, FinCon and XYPN aside, I typically don't do uh, free speaking engagements. So now when I, when I speak, I only speak to um, potential clients, groups of potential clients, whether it's women, education, that sort of thing, and I get paid for speaking. And then with that paid speaking fee, I can offer these books at a discounted rate. The book sells for $12.99 on Amazon, but then I can offer them a discounted rate of you know, five to $6. So for the speaking gigs, the, the organizer of the events will reach out to me and I charge them a flat fee. And then if I have the book, I let them know. You know, with the book now I say, okay, I also have this book if you wanted to purchase it for your attendees. It's up to them to find the sponsors to get the money to pay for the books. Um, it's really, I mean, I've spoken to nonprofits for women. I've spoken to other bigger financial institutions have hired me to speak to their clients about um, different things. It's, it's mostly corporations, I'd say, nonprofits, that sort of thing. It's not, I don't do a lot of um, like local, like let's hop around to the, the group and do a lot of that type of thing anymore. Does that make sense? So, oh, HR departments are good too. Um, reaching out to, if you have, um, having the book has helped me to create a, a presentation called Put Your Money, where you, Work Your Wealth and Put Your Money Where Your Heart Is. Um, and now I can reach out, if I wanted to, reach out to human resources departments and come to their offices and offer these types of present this presentation to their group, and then I can offer them books as well. So HR departments are huge when it, term when it comes to um, education and speaking. 
Any questions on that? How many of you have a blog? Oh, go ahead. I see my speaking engagements as a way to mostly build brand awareness. To be honest, I use it as like more marketing. So when I speak, typically, I have somebody taking pictures. I'm leveraging on social media. Um, it looks great that you're out there educating people. So it's mostly, I don't necessarily always speak to potential clients. That's the goal. But I'd say it's probably the revenue. It's mostly the marketing. And the, the like just like you have like the as seen in on your on your website, that's kind of how I see it. I see it as another marketing, like just to enhance my brand and image. So, a mix, I guess. Does that make Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're saying that that's not the way that you generate Um, it's it's for the book. For the book, it is. I'd say I probably get like a client or two. Like I spoke at something in Arizona recently. I got like six or seven different clients. I'd probably clients. I guess a mix. Probably clients. I think would probably. Be, it's not the income. Definitely not the income. I would say no. <laughs> no on these on the speaking income. I have increased fees, but I would say. Um, for me personally, having my personal stuff, I have a baby at home, so now my new thing is I want to have a podcast and not travel as much. So the speaking fees aren't necessarily the income. It's I want to figure out how to get in front of clients and stay at home with my kid. <laughs> So the same way that you guys would probably pitch to get on the podcast or pitch to be quoted in like the media, the way that um, I've done it in the past, or if I have done it, it's first putting together, you need to put together like your, your uh, what's it called? Your deck, like have your two to three presentations that you already have put together and have like some creative titles and know who your target audience is for those. So don't like pitch a company that works with only 30 somethings if you wanna be working with like people at like Qualcomm out here, for example. So having something geared specifically towards them and having those titles in place and some like, you know, three to four takeaways, like bullet points underneath those is a good way to start when you're pitching. And then you're gonna go to the HR department and you're gonna say, hey, I know that you, Qualcomm, for example, you guys have, you know, lots of issues and questions around stock options. I have these presentations. Here's how I helped clients in the past. I would love to come, you know, share this with you. Here's how I can provide some value to your, to your employees, that sort of thing. So just making sure that it's very targeted what you're doing, not just saying like, not just mass emailing HR departments and saying like, I have, you know, this general financial education thing, which I think they probably get a lot. So making sure that you are addressing their needs specifically. Um, and then for fees, get your foot in the door first and then talk to them about fees. Don't just, don't add that to your pitch email. Um, any other questions before I, I move on? A little bit, of, so in terms of where you should be before having the book, and, and so we'll just jump around probably, with um, your audience. So to be honest, my list when I, my, my list when I was launching was probably about 2,000 for my newsletter list, which is peanuts for PinCon, by the way, like tiny, tiny, tiny people. Um, it's, big, it's big for other people, though, too. So that's where my list was. Um, for me, the exposure, I built up my brand um, in Facebook groups. And so it was, it's mostly, you want to put a launch team together. You don't necessarily have to have a lot of exposure, but you need to have help to get you launched in that marketing. So you don't want to just write a book and be like, I wrote a book, and then like things won't happen. But what I did, and we can jump into that. So you're gonna to put together a launch team. I don't know if you guys have heard about those before. Um, about a month before I launched, I put a call out to like friends, family, um, people who would be a good target for this book, who should be reading it or I thought would be reading it, um, and asked them, hey, I'm looking to put some people on the launch team. I'm giving out free copies of the book. Here's just what I would ask of you, open it on this feedback. Um, I had, I put together, it's called WooFu, like a WooFu form, so people could apply to be on the launch team. I asked them about, themselves in terms of their businesses, their followers, those things as well. Um, and that was actually where I got a lot of my exposure from post book, having about 20 people around me to help promote the book on launch day. They were sharing about it. They were helping to like get reviews as well. That sort of thing helped to build the exposure. And then it was maximizing opportunities where, um, you know, doing like a Kindle sale, you know, cause Kindle you can, you can price it whatever the heck you want, you know, swings. So I would do, you know, work, Workable Wealth just turned three. I put the book on sale for $3 for like the month of August, for example. So stuff like that, and then doing a, 
doing a push at that, at that point. So building it up afterwards is fine, just making sure that you at least have a launch team in place. And it's just not you and like a marketing person because then it's not likely to be sustainable. And it definitely is, I view this as more of like a long haul brand, like long haul brand awareness as opposed to, I wasn't measuring like the number of sales I really got launch week. You know, it's cool to look at, but this is something that's brand enhancing for, you know, years into the future. Oh, should you start a blog? Did we ask that already? Did I ask that? Who has a blog? Okay, so if you don't like writing, I would at least, I would at least start a blog before you write a book, because that's going to be even harder. <laughs> um, I would recommend writing a blog, because by writing the blog for Workable Wealth, I got to see which posts got the most clicks. I got to see the titles that were the catchiest. I got to answer questions from my target audience. So by having that blog, um, I had already addressed a lot of concerns and questions and had my own voice in the mix. So when it came time for me to write the book, what I did, I had researched other personal finance books that are out there. I checked out table of contents and I checked out like the worksheets that were included. And then I looked at those and then I wrote my own table of contents for Work Your Wealth. That was basically what happened. I wrote my own table of contents and then I had a project manager, like project manager was like the best investment, Kaylee Hawk, I don't know if she's in here. Kaylee was my, she's speaking next. She was my project manager for this. Um, fantastic, I basically told this woman, I was like, I am paying you to bully me and to hold me accountable. Like I be mean to me if I miss deadlines. Um, I had, to, I'm the kind of person who had to work under that accountability. Otherwise it's just, I just work better under pressure. So we had the table of contents ready. And then what we did is we put timelines, basically due dates for each chapter attached. I had a due date for when I needed to get her, she, she was my project manager and my editor. If you guys need editor recommendations, let me know afterwards. I actually pulled some um, contacts to share with you. Um, so she was my project manager and editor. She gave me a due date to have a rough draft to her. She then had a due date for her edited version back to me. And then I had a due date for my finalized chapter to be done. And that basically we worked through each chapter that way and then pulled the book together and then did the same thing again, basically finalized versions. So with that table of contents though, then what I had, I think she did it or I did it, somebody did it. We went through all of my blog titles and took each blog title and put it under its respective chapter that it could apply to. So not every blog post was going to apply to the book, but I already had some of that content created. And so we were able to basically pull from that and align it with what was already, you know, wh where it needed to be. So that was actually very helpful in having some of the content done and then it was weaving it together that needed to happen. So you don't have to start a blog, but I would say it makes life a lot easier. I, so I started writing um, probably about, it was a year and a half, two years probably, a year and a half. And then I was writing every every other week, I think. Is, I was writing weekly at first, then it went to every two weeks. And um, I'd probably say maybe like three-fourths of that was like relevant content that I could pull from. How many of you are considering hiring a ghostwriter for your book? Okay, so again, so just going back to everything that we have talked about, so making sure before you go to your ghostwriter, make sure that you at least know your client avatar and the voice that you do want it to have. Um, those are big things, like don't spend the money on a ghostwriter if you don't, are not very clear on who you're going to be marketing this to. Make sure you're very clear on that audience. And the marketing strategy on the other side, like invest your money and then make sure that we're leveraging it. So building your brand community. Um, let's see, I just wanna make sure I get all my notes here. Okay, so where I was when I launched, I had my newsletter list, I had like Facebook page, maybe like a thousand likes, Twitter was about 4,000, and then like I said, my Facebook, or my, my marketing strategy for the book was to be very active in Facebook groups, which is where my target audience is. So for you, understanding where your target audience is, like who are, so I guess in terms of writing books, who would be your potential audiences? Does anybody have ideas? Military people. Perfect, okay, so there's probably a ton of nonprofits that you could leverage, you know, in terms of, if you're in San Diego especially, and of course, oh, hi. Okay, <laughs> so you probably already know, like, nonprofits, you have people, you probably could put together a launch community or launch team pretty quickly and, and leverage those resources. So nonprofits would be a good thing for you and networking groups. Uh, boomers within 10 years of retirement. Boomers within 10 years of retirement, okay. So where do you think, where are your clients hanging out, potential clients? Okay. I don't know, more, more than you'd think on Facebook, but. Uh, 
more than anything on Facebook. So if they're on Facebook, the biggest thing is this is where and we're. I'm all about, you know, I know the compliance stuff. So Facebook page is one thing. Facebook groups are huge. If you can put together a Facebook group and basically get people to join that and start, you'll be starting and like basically moderating the conversation in that group. So I have a Facebook group called Work Your Wealth and every day is branded where it's, I think it's Monday, shoot, I don't remember. It's like two, Investment Tuesday, Money Moves Wednesday, Real Talk Thursday, Financial One Friday. So what, basically each day has a theme and then every day has a question. And so I know that sounds overwhelming, but if you put together just like you would an editorial calendar of something for each day, all you have to do is pop into Facebook for like 30 seconds with whatever that topic is and let people basically ask their questions. You're like, hey, you're transitioning to, you're 10 years out from retirement. Like, what are your goals? Or how do you envision your retirement? Or what are some of the most pressing questions you have? Or investments, how do you think your investments should be you know, allocated during this time period leading up to retirement? Or can you stomach the volatility? So I basically have a disclaimer saying I'm not gonna give you specific investment advice, but I want people to engage in conversation and I have strict terms I know we all are scared about competition and all that fun stuff, but as the group moderator, you can also eject people from the group. That's the awesome part. Um, I have strict rules about no selling or any of that stuff, and I have deleted people from my group who are like pushing insurance products or something. Yes. Totally, totally, yeah. If you have readers on that blog, definitely direct them there. So now anytime somebody signs up for my general like opt-in, my freemium on my website, I invite the women to, to join my Work Your Well Facebook group. Uh, but, uh, sorry guys, it's just it's a different conversation and, and women, are just, they are, I've talked to so many of them, they feel very insecure. Um, so yeah, but yeah, but if you started a Facebook group, if you already have an existing audience somewhere and they are your ideal client, your ideal reader, direct them to like a Facebook group because that's gonna be, for me it's better than my newsletter because I actually am having ongoing interactions with them. They're commenting, I'm you know giving feedback and I, I've been at it now for like, for since the, before the book launched so I'm not necessarily in there every day but it's really cool for me to be able to see other people talking to each other and cheering each other on and giving feedback and having them do that under the, the Work Your Wealth kind of group is, is pretty nice and that you know, that's how I was saying earlier, I have women in that group who maybe don't participate in conversation, there's a lot of lurkers, I call them. They lurk, they kind of like just read and they observe and absorb. But there's a woman in that group who is active in other Facebook groups and when somebody in another Facebook group asks, do you know a financial planner, she tags me in. I've landed multiple clients from this woman, I know her name, her name only, I can't even send her a thank you note because this woman tags me in and she's on the prowl in other groups for I don't know what, but. So, you know, so that's like the interesting thing about marketing and brand awareness. Like you're providing value. I think Brian and Bo talked about this. You're providing value and helping these people in their lives and they might not be qualified, but they're telling other people about you as well. And that's what really helps with the marketing. Any questions? Or, go ahead. So limiting it, you want to limit like who you're giving it away to basically. So that's why I created the launch team. It wasn't necessarily, they basically, I'm happy to give this, this book to you for free if you give me some feedback. And so there was kind of some give and take there and I knew they were invested, they were interested in the book, they wanted to read it, they were invested in making that financial change in their life as opposed to saying, here, have a book, book for you, book for you, book for you, because I couldn't be sure that those were the people who would take action on it or actually read it. So um, I think on the front end, I probably, I had about 20 people in the launch book and on the launch team, but I had this woo form thing where people could apply to be on the launch team or, or I'd put things in the Facebook group saying, hey, I'm putting together this group, let me know if you wanna join. So people dropped in their email addresses. I had my um, admin person at the time put together a whole list. And so what happens is I picked 20 people for the launch team, everybody else, I didn't wanna just like drop them into the newsletter list because I felt like, you know, that's not nice, don't do that. But I offered them um, the first two chapters of the book for free if they signed up through like a lead pages opt-in basically. So I still got them, I got them to opt into the book for some of the free chapters that way and thanked them for their interest. And then, then they were then on like the book update list. Was your launch team also, uh, was, was there anyone in there that, was, that you wanted to do a review for the book for Amazon purposes? Yes. Yes, there were people in there that I asked for reviews. And so Amazon basically, but there was no like, you get this book for free, blah, blah, blah. You basically, if you enjoyed the book and feel so compelled, please leave a review. Amazon, did go you, ahead. Did you read the review book? Or how, how did you, what was the process of getting them to do the review and then post it to Amazon? 
So I was getting feedback throughout, like the leading up to it, of like, you know, what's the what were what's the takeaways? Is there anything missing? How is the tone of the book? Do you feel like this is bite-sized and actionable? These were the questions I was asking of the of the readers. So I was already interacting with them, and then I was keeping them in the loop of like, okay, we're T-minus X days to launch day, a week out. Here's launch day. Here's what I'm going to ask of you. Here's some. Oh, um, my marketing person put together a whole. Um, basically swipe file for launch, basically says like, here's the tweets that you can post out, here's the text that you can share on social media. So they had, I was sharing those things with them leading up for the launch day. And then on launch day, I basically said, hey, thanks so much for your help, now's the time. If you feel so compelled, please leave a review. So I just asked them for reviews. I assumed they wouldn't say that it sucked after they'd been invested in the process. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's part of it with Amazon. I can tell you, I think I only have, I mean, for reviews, the reviews aren't necessarily a huge thing, again, because this is like we're building our practices around this. So I'm not looking to get like a thousand reviews on my book. And I think I probably have like, I had 50. Amazon wiped a bunch of them. I don't know the Amazon. I'm still learning that, to be honest. Somebody else can tell you guys about what's OK and what's not OK for Amazon reviews. I know they wiped some that were totally OK. Your friends and family, if, they, if you have shipped anything, when you publish to Kindle, it's attached to your own Amazon, so your personal Amazon stuff. So basically, if you've shipped your mom or your best friend or your brother or something, they can't leave a review for you. They will delete it. They know who your mom, your best friend, and your brother is. So if you've shipped anything, just so you know, I've learned that. And your mother-in-law. Um, so there's those two. So just be aware that like it has to be legit type stuff. And even if it's like other financial planners, um, I, I don't know. I have people who are like, oh, I worked with Mary Beth forever, and this is great for this group, and they left it there. I don't know. So I can't figure out the Amazon thing. But for review-wise, um, OK, so other things, review-wise, I, um, Kindle, you can manage the pricing. Cre I did Create Spaces when you do the print. So just quick takeaways I forgot to mention. This is published through Create Space. You have the option of them assigning you an ISBN number, or you can pay $10 for yours. Pay $10 for yours. I was taught this by my book cover designer. Otherwise, it's going to say published like, through Create Space on the back of it or whatever. So just spend the $10 so that you can have your own branded thing fully. Um, yeah, so with Kindle, though, oh, they give you the option of basically doing um, like a book match program or people who are in, enrolled in the Kindle, whatever, pay the monthly fee, they can get your book for free. That is a sometimes a strategy for people to like get eyes on the book, but just know that's being offered to everybody who is like not your target audience. So I think I, I chose to do it for three months, which was like fine. Um, but from the reviews that I read for the program, it's going out there to anybody and everybody. So if they're if you have like a, if I have a 75 year old reading my book, they're probably gonna be like, hmm, not for me, and they might not have like the best things to say about it. So know that when you open it up like that, you're no longer just targeting your ideal audience, you're targeting everybody and anybody, and there's gonna be people who are probably not happy with it, and those people could leave reviews. Even though they paid you zero dollars, I think you make like 30 cents off of it or whatever, but you then have a bad review. What is CreateSpace? CreateSpace is where you can actually self-publish and get the print book. Kindle is going to be the online. So when you create this, um, you'll hire a book designer for you who will do, my designer did my book cover and she designed my interior. You can do um, 99 Designs does stuff like this. I chose to leverage again, I'm big in Facebook groups. I put a call out, interviewed people, wanted to make sure they knew what they were doing and I chose my designer and um, opted to use her also for the interior. So that process actually took much longer than I thought. Uh, I think that the interior design and the cover design I think was a couple month process too. So during all of that, I was, you know, you're reading and rereading and rereading your book. So I, I don't even know if I actually have a final edited version of this text anymore. It's been edited so much. So keep that in mind. And, and the good thing about self-publishing is ultimately you can go in there and edit it at any time because this book is printed on demand. When somebody orders it, then it goes out. I don't have like a stockpile sitting somewhere. I think it was about between 2000 and 2500 for the book design, the book interior, the interior design and the editing and the project management. So if you are like good on like writing all of that stuff yourself, um, you don't need an accountability partner like I did, you could probably get by. I think I probably paid her. 
I think I paid like four or 500 for the cover and the back cover design. And I think the interior, she charged me hourly. That might have been about seven or $800. Yeah. Uh, but the edit, okay. No, no, it's just you, edit, you can re-edit the same PDF and you're just re-uploading basically a new PDF in there. Yeah, this is available in the ebook form. Is that what you mean? Like, so that you can get this online in ebook or you, and you can get it print. There's both options available. So, um, so I was just saying, for example, I was thinking I was talking to Hillary. Um, sorry, Hillary, I've thrown your name out like 12 times since we were just talking. Um, <laughs> So uh, a friend of mine just linked to my book in her newsletter and then somebody else had written, mentioned my book like when it launched in March and that article got, re like, got picked up again in the past 24 hours. I've sold like 40 books, half via Kindle, half via print. So definitely have book. Uh, Kindle, start Kindle. I think print is nice because some people just, for, especially for personal finance, they want to highlight it um, and check things off. The other side. I basically want it to have as a marketing strategy. I'm not looking to be a New York Times bestseller. If that happens out of the, the great down the road for my you know third or fourth book, um, but I don't, I don't. My goal wasn't to basically top the charts. We're not going to make money off the book. And the thing with being New York Times bestseller is it opens up a whole lot of other distractions from our actual practice of doing that financial advising. So by doing this and launching it out to the strategic audience, by building my brand there, I'm allowed to build my practice within my niche and I have the time to ramp it up as opposed to say, hey, let's make this a New York Times bestseller and have everybody open it. Like you, have, you just have like so much discussion, you have so many other things, people calling you for speaking engagements. It's basically, a whole, that would be a whole business pivot basically. You'd almost be deciding you wanna become that talking head person instead of actually building that practice. Anything else? They had scouted me out, and so they weren't like, uh, yeah, they had scouted me out and by reading some of the terms and just digging into it, and I was like, mm, it's okay. <laughs> that, was, that was just, again, me personally, um, just because I'm a controlling person. That's just how, especially for now. The other things, just uh, before we go in, so uh, in the front of this book, so I chose Jess Lively is a big creative podcaster. Um, lots of women follow her podcast. I chose to have her write my introduction, or I asked her to write my introduction. That helped in terms of marketing as well for the, for the launch. Um, and then when you go in here, um, so she did the forward, and then I have an invitation. So right in the, right in the beginning, there's an invitation to um, join the Facebook group and also head to workyourwealthbook.com, and then I have all sp spreadsheets and templates to go along with the book. So I asked people right away to get back on the newsletter list. It was other people's Facebook groups, to be honest, leading up to the launch, because if I, by being in those Facebook groups, just for my business in general, becoming the go-to financial planner, um, the, the founders of some of those bigger groups have become you know, friends or people I've chatted with on the phone, so they are more than willing to promote my book to their audience. So one of the, one of the people bought my book for all of the people in her like, course, basically, bought a Kindle version. So stuff like that, by leveraging other people's Facebook groups, like mine's much smaller in comparison to like thousands of people. So that's been really helpful for me. They are um, like creative entrepreneurs, lots of online entrepreneurs basically. And so again, like you'll get a big mix of people who are, you know, startups trying to like launch their side hustle and some people have legitimate businesses bringing in like two hundred to fifty thousand dollars and they need help getting organized. And those are the people who buy the book and then schedule consultations and that's been nice. Compliance? Well, I'm an RIA, so Everything's, uh, everything's archived through Reg Ard, Re or Reg or Kobe or whatever who I use for my compliance archiving. Um, and realistically, I just, I don't talk about investments or returns. I talk about like, what are your goals? What are the things you're struggling with? If I don't, if I, st I stay away from like any terms of numbers or like percentages and it's all education based and that's basically it. And a lot of the time I'm redirecting people back to my website. So in terms of 
Um, the biggest thing I do when, I, when people, because people will share my book and say like, she's amazing, blah, blah, blah. That's the one where I'm like, don't reshare, don't like, don't do anything. I, just, I freeze there and I'm like, you know, and I just, I don't, I don't do anything with those, but otherwise everything's archived and in term, until I'm told I can't educate people. That's kind of how I look at it. Does that, so I just try not to be too scared. I feel like I'm not doing anything unethical and um, it's general financial planning concepts and topics that we're talking about. It's not like I'm guaranteeing anybody that they're gonna, I don't even say like you're gonna pay off $10,000 of debt, by, there's no guarantees. It's, I say at the end of this book, this is great, I gave you the information, but you still have to take action. This is, that's all, that's all I do. Does that help a bit? I know you probably, you look like you still have anxiety. <laughs> So can I say that up here? To start your own? Yeah, is that a? So the other thing is, I mean, so my Facebook, everything is moderated under my, my stuff personally as well. So that's like another, you know, business versus, it. I, I mean, I can't be much help there. I feel like just dip your toe in the water and I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have my own compliance guy who works with Jeff Rose and all the other ones and I feel like he knows enough to tell me if I'm wrong. That's basically it. So I have my own compliance person who basically, I run everything by him. So he, the biggest thing that I've found now is this, if you're an RIA, should probably run through a separate business. Like my income coming from this and speaking, those should be in a separate entity. So that's like the biggest takeaway. Um, for my target audience, it's checklists and quick and easy action steps. Um, but if you're working with like, engineers, they want like the long form thousand word blog post that's digging into a topic like Joshua Sheets, wherever he is, like talk to him about his stuff or Michael Kitsis, that's the content they want. So it really depends on your target audience. My target audience also though, I mean, there's, it's also very overdone between the 400 to 600 word blog posts. It's just five action steps to blah, blah, blah. Like that's overdone. They don't want that anymore and they're not gonna necessarily click that. So um, it's, a, it's basically giving them like bite sized things that they can do for the, for like the 30 and 40 something like business owner, busy parents, like, hey, check out these three quick books or like bookkeeping things if you're not doing that or whatever it is, like little things like that. Just giving them like something small they can take away and do. And the checklist in terms of downloads are actually good as well. So if you have a blog and then you lead them to like, oh, check out this guide that'll give you these 10 steps, that's, those do well also. Just make sure that your PDFs are kind of eye appealing. Uh, let's go here and then we'll go you. <laughs> Okay, so this is my like imposter syndrome moment, guys. You think when you write a book and they're like, this is fantastic and it shows up on your doorstep and you're like, oh my God, it's too short. Oh my God, that's, I looked at it and I was horrified because you think of how many pages it is and you're like, that's enough. I was so upset about how short it was. I couldn't, I couldn't celebrate. And then I called like 10 of my other financial planner friends who were like, remember your target audience and remember that they don't need like a Tony Robbins size like financial planning book. They're looking for something small. So that was basically how it got decided. It's about 150 pages, which is good for my audience. Um, it's all very high level stuff. I basically walk through my financial planning process in this and, and let them do it them and walk them through how to do it themselves with action checklists. And then I didn't add any of the, use these spreadsheets at the back. They have to go to the work your wealth book dot com to download those things, which I would say is very, is good because you get their email addresses and then it also will save you money in terms of formatting for the interior design. So don't try and not having somebody have to do a lot of charts and all that stuff is gonna help you save money on the launch. Wait, let's go over here really quickly. Um, no, because those who will opt in, they'll opt back out right away if that's the case. So I've seen, I can see people subscribe and unsubscribe right away because that's all they're looking to do. They're, they're just shopping for that and, and then they're back out again. So um, obviously, I mean, versus getting it for free, there's more clicks on the free version because they can just open it up. But that's kind of what I've seen is people will opt in and 
I haven't seen an issue really. No idea how many words my book is, <laughs> especially because I was saying it was edited so many times. I'm not sure anymore. I can get you that after <laughs> afterwards. Um, in terms of the process, when I launched my my business, it was all in house because I was you know trying to save a, a buck. So I wrote all my blogs. I did all my social media. Um, then I had um, I basically hired Kaylee Hawk. She had started doing my my social media management. So she managed my blog posting, my my scheduling of social media. Now I have somebody else who, who writes for or not writes for me, who manages those things. So I have an editorial calendar that basically I do at the beginning of each year. So each month has a topic. I write a blog post every two weeks um, that goes with that topic and there's social media tweets that are basically scheduled out ahead of time as well to go along with that. So then my marketing director assistant person, she goes in and plugs that all in at the first of each month. So that's all basically streamlined. Um, for the newsletter, I go back and forth. I've tried to have that outsource me. I'm, my brand, my voice is very associated with my brand. So outsourcing that I struggle with. So the newsletter is the one thing that I personally haven't offloaded yet, but that even then like that takes, so my newsletter will go out right now at 11 o'clock. Um, yesterday a blog post went up. Now my newsletter basically says it pulls from the blog post and then it also at the bottom it says around the web. And when I've been quoted anywhere or have relevant articles, I share those out as well. Uh, and that's like a value add. So it's, I'm not trying to make it all about me. I'm trying to make it about like, here's some relevant stuff for you as new parents, business owners, blah, blah, blah. So when you're sharing, I tried, I'm very much of the abundance mentality on that, on that note as well. Um, so that's how things get planning ahead of time using leveraging social media. The book, um, that basically gets calendared in with different process, with different projects. So I'm launching a podcast. That'll probably be the focus for the next six months while I'm doing that. And then the book might be at the end of next year. So when I launched the book, um, I actually said this in the beginning, I had just had a baby and I had actually prepped my clients that I was not going to be available for like X period of time. So that kind of became, and the baby sleep, slept a lot in the beginning and you, I should have slept. Um, I think I, I would spend like a Saturday writing, like uh, all day Saturday would be my writing. I think I'd spend, those were my writing days and that was all the time. Now that everything is launched, now I really just do like, I'll do a, if I get contacted for speaking, I'll push it out. I don't necessarily even solicit that much speaking. Um, and then I'll do like a discount for whatever reason, like through the end of the month, like I'll do a year end like type of thing probably. And last month I did the $3. So that goes out in the newsletter on Facebook and those sort of things as well. And that's really all the things I do. Um, Facebook, the groups I probably spend, I've unfollowed most groups. Um, in terms of alerts, I'll spend maybe 10 minutes a day in my Facebook group. If I even actually get in there, I've been at conferences all week and I just make sure I put that out there like, hey, I'm gone. And I have my marketing director log in under me and she'll post some stuff too, like the little prompts, she'll post those. Um, and then, what was I going to say? I forgot. Oh, most of my time is on Instagram trying to figure that out. That is where my social media stuff is. I'm trying to build my audience there because that is where my target audience is. So it's awful trying to do really pretty pictures and quotes. <laughs> so that's where. Uh, No, I, I stay away from all the affiliate links. I, uh, and I don't really want to just because I feel like it blurs the lines for me. Um, I don't, with, with my compliance person, I just didn't, I don't have the time to do the separate stuff and all of that. So even when I have like super fun, like business partners, creative entrepreneurs are launching a course, they want to send me like, you know, send out a link and I basically, I just turn that all down, which actually makes it a lot easier to say no to everything. Because when you do affiliate links, I feel like that blurs the brand. That blurs who you're, what you're doing. And so for me, I want to keep everything workable well, just, like just that, I don't want to necessarily. Yeah, revenue and then the book is, is good. Um, I have a newlywed money boot camp also that um, was, so I did like a course for a while because that was another thing that we can talk about that after as well. Um, I did that also as a revenue stream um, or just a way to basically help people who are reaching out. And then um, I, so the speaking, I, I get income from that, but it's not a goal. And then I do get paid for some writing as well at a price that I can't turn down. So, <laughs> good to go you in. We'll come back. Yeah, 
I know, I was like, this sounds like I'm doing, it. so a lot of this stuff is streamlined. Like a lot of, so this, like even like being here today, I typically don't talk to advisors anymore, or not, I love you guys. I don't do as much of like the talking to advisor audiences because my time is, is spent with client stuff. So a lot of the marketing is very streamlined. I probably say I'd spend, I spend like, especially now, like 40 hours a week doing the advising and other stuff is, it's, I'm in a, I'm in a season, I call it a season of like hustle. So 40 hours a week goes to client and advising. Anything above and beyond that goes to marketing. And with launching the podcast too, it's, it's a busy time. I finished it, everything. I, because I had had the, the feedback on the blogs and I had had the feedback from those people who were trying to schedule consultations and, and I, knew, I had already had existing clients and questions that were commonly asked. So I wrote it based off of those things and then I asked for feedback. So it was, it was basically done. And then I put it out there to see is there anything missing really. And I was getting, um, I was getting feedback kind of through the writing process, but I, I just jumped in. I didn't wait to say like, hey, would this topic be, because realistically I already knew there was a need for it and a different voice for it. So I didn't want, you're gonna get a lot of people like, no, you're gonna get so much feedback if you're asking for like, hey, does this idea work? Like, who would you, you have to figure out, like you have to ask like five people only, you know, limit your feedback from people. If you're doing a proposal, like don't just put it out there to like a blanket, 2,000 people, I'm writing a book, like what do you think? Because I think you'll get so much information, you'll end up paralyzed by just like what to do with that. Does that make sense? So I do financial, so I just wanna make sure I'm good on time, we have 10 minutes. Um, I do financial planning, I just started doing AUM again this year. So that's all, it's all just ramping up again. That was, yeah, exactly. So my fees have just, ever since you know I, I launched, I launched Workable Wealth because I was in the traditional firm, couldn't really do what I wanted to do, couldn't work with the target that I wanted to work with, started doing the monthly retainer model, got busy, and you increase your fees over time. So I just I bumped that up. And, um, and now what I do also as part of it, I do financial planning, I do financial business coaching as well. Because a lot of my clients are entrepreneurs um, and trying to grow their businesses. So that's become something different. I would say it's probably 50% blog posts. The other part, like just written, there's a part at the end, like the last chapter of the book is like commonly asked questions. And so I, I did that like as like a wrap up, like here's like, should you buy a house or pay down student loan debt or like those sort of things. Like, so I did that as like a wrap up chapter for like some of the common questions. And then 50% of the rest of the book or 50% of the book as a whole was probably blog posts. And then stuff for in between, weaving it together, pulling relevant statistics, making sure that like, I also tried to include I think we changed the name, but just like stories of, you know, adding in those experiences of people that you've talked to or like things, you know, whether they make 50,000 or 300,000, they could still be in tons of debt, so you're not alone. Like those are the things that I, I tried, I, I weave those in to make it relevant as opposed to just like, here's your five steps. I gave a lot of stories as well. So stories are what make people relate and that's what's gonna keep them invested also in keeping and continuing to read. Not at all. I think if you write the book, it's just knowing what you're doing with it. Like don't write the book just to write the book. Write the book and know like who, like I said, know who it's for, know how you're gonna leverage it and then continuing to have some sort of plan. And you don't have to do, like it's streamlined now. I do something once a month, you know, once every few months because I put it back out there. You know, you have it, so why not leverage it to build some sort of like clicks to your site or get traffic there. Um, but no, I, I mean, you don't have to do that at all. I think it's really just using it as a tool to provide value to people who either are your target client or could be your target client at some, you know, short time period. Now let's go to the back really fast. I'll come right back to you. Go ahead. And so writing the book without audience, I think, like I said earlier, I think just having your launch team in place, you don't necessarily have to have like that audience, but 
having like your client avatar and finding those people. So you don't have to have 2,000 or 200. Who are those 20 people who will help you to promote it and are on your team and are a fan of what you do? And if you don't have those, I would start there first, so finding those people who are supportive of you in a supportive network and then go into writing the book because you wanna make sure you at least have those people who can give you open and honest feedback and who are willing to as opposed to just like bunk hunkering down writing the book and not having any insight or feedback on it. So I think just starting with the launch team, you can start, you know, starting there is the place to start. And then, and then again, it's over time it builds brand awareness. So this, my brand has definitely grown from it. My brand, I, so you know, I started off in one area and now I have speaking in more stuff as well. And, it, and that's basically, but I don't think you have to start with the audience. I would just start with figuring out who your launch team could be. Uh, there was another question. I don't know. Oh, there, sorry. I don't know. I, so my biggest thing is like, so I am a big marketing and like visually appealing person. So my only thing is if I, if I, if I did the traditional, I would just want, I need like the, I need the, the cover design stuff. I just think that's a big part of it, like for the packaging. Um, and I've seen and heard so many st horror stories of like just what other people are experiencing and what, you know, and not having control over that. So I'm, I'm torn. I don't necessarily think I need to do the traditional. Would it be cool for like, if I wanted to again, be a talking head? Yes. But if I can keep self-publishing and providing value to the people that I want to work with, I don't, I mean, I feel like it's probably less pressure that way for me anyways. I'd rather just keep control of it. Did you have any slides? I probably did. Yeah, we were on seven. I had like 20 guys, but we talked through everything. Uh, write a book, some content, next steps. We talked about that, imposter syndrome. Organize the book. Who should you focus on? Did you make a business plan for your book? Yes, probably. That's just like, again, like your, so my, my project management stuff went from writing the book through like the marketing and launch of the book too. So my timeline went through all of that. So when you are starting out, figure out what your end date is and then add in like a month or two for the launch strategy as well. So creating some sort of plan around that and knowing again, one minute, okay. All right, I think we're done. I have, we have to wrap up, okay. Oh, well, let's, let's come up afterwards, we can, we can chat, okay. <laughs>